I'll be online. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Vanessa from Stanford, uh, coming from the biomedical informatics department. But you'll see immediately from her talk, it's about everything except for biomedical informatics. That's really uh, she's done all <laughs> kinds of interesting things, like run a science podcast at Stanford the last couple of years, and uh, contributed to open large projects. Uh, is a full stack uh, developer from Docker all the way to interfaces. And in particular, is extremely uh, curious uh, and interested in how people use information and uh, all of the kinds of uh, projects that we're doing. So, uh, thanks. Cool. Thanks. So, uh, I first want to say thank you so much for having me here today. I, I don't think I can duly express in words how excited I am to be at Microsoft Research. Um, yes, I am Vanessa, and I'm unfortunately we are, we are not a department; we're a program in biomedical informatics, but it's just as good. Um, I just defended my dissertation uh, a couple like a week and a half ago. So I put the PhD, but I don't officially walk until, uh, in until June. So I kind of feel like I need to do something like that. Like, eh, I'm not really sure when the official time is when you actually get your PhD. Anyway, so I'm here today. I have prepared a talk for you called Graduate School Between the Lines. And as you sort of have alluded to, I am not going to be talking about my thesis work. Um, the interesting thing about graduate school is it's really this amazing time where you can just try new things and learn and take risks. And a lot of people probably don't realize that. I was lucky to sort of realize it early on. So I just have had a ton of fun trying out random projects to learn. And so today I'm going to be presenting you sort of a random sampling of some of these projects. And my goal is really to try to give you a sense of how I think about exploring data, how my own train of thinking has sort of evolved over time, um, and just how fun this sort of work is. So I want to open up with a little bit of a story. When I was a very tiny Vanessa, um, I just loved to run. That was my passion. And what you're looking at here is my first little award. I, I ran a freshman race two miles, and I got seventh place. And the, realize that the reason that I loved running is because it was just really, really fun. It was challenging. It was always a little bit different. Um, and so today, I want to try to convince to you that graduate school really has a lot of parallels with competitive running. So, you know, here we're at the start. This is where you're admitted, and you're just totally scared. You're a little bit anxious, but you're really excited. You know, the first, you make it through the first quarter of the race, and you don't have a plan, and you're not really sure what's going on. That's probably the hardest part. Then you get to this qualifying exam, and that's where people probably drop out. Maybe they don't continue on the race. But then once you make it through there, then you have a little bit of a plan, but you have to make, formally articulate that at your proposal. So you stand in front of a bunch of people, and you make you say, this is the interesting problem that I'm going to be working on. You make it through that interesting problem, and then hopefully the remainder, the third quarter of the race, you're cruising. You get to that defense. You do your defense. You pass. And then hopefully you graduate. And so here we So this is sort of the framework that I'm going to be taking today as I talk to you about some of these projects. Here we have our little runner. And so if you can imagine being on the starting line, what would be the question that is in your head? How long until graduation? <laughs> yes, it's, it's something like that. Are my shoes tied? <laughs> Are my shoes tied? That's another important thing. So at the start of my journey, I was at the starting line, and I wasn't really thinking of hard questions at that point. I said, do I have what it takes to do this? Do I even have what it takes to, to essentially get to the end of the race? So I said, well, let me see if I can use data to answer this, because I didn't really have a good way. So I came up with, uh, so these are the four criteria that my program requires for sort of to be a good biomedical informaticist. You need domain expertise, programming, uh, essentially sort of methods, machine learning, and then of course communication. So I put together all these criteria, and for each one I had a very specific set of rules. For example, this is for uh, domain knowledge, and for example, in, in domain knowledge, if you have impact, you get a score of one. Your mom might be proud of you if you wrote a paper about it. You get a score of four if you get a nature paper. And so I scored myself all on this. And in the first quarter, we we're also learning this new programming language called R. So I wrote a little script and I, you know, I, to, to calculate my graduate student avatar. And I calculated and I visualized my progress. And so green is what I've accomplished. Blue is what I have to go. These are different things, programming, communication, et cetera, et cetera. And this is how my progress. And I figured out really quickly that I had a lot to learn. I had a lot to do. However, this is OK. Like, so this was the first quarter of graduate school. And um, this is a really hard time in the race, because your Stanford courses are hard. And so you're taking a lot of courses. And, and I was doing everything that I thought I was supposed to be doing. I was identifying this, this important question. So I saw my calls up ahead, and I sped through those calls. I got through the calls. But 
something happened. I, I had a problem. And the problem was that I had doubt. I said, maybe I don't have what it takes to be a researcher. But it wasn't really just doubt alone. It was this realization that the problems that I'm working on, they don't seem that interesting. And I'm not really having that much fun. And so I'm sort of lying there on, on the little track and I'm saying, <laughs> what is my vision? Because up to this point, I have done everything the way that I'm supposed to be doing it. And I feel like I'm following a template, a conveyor belt. And I'm not really sure that I'm following sort of my gut. Maybe I could have more fun. Why isn't this fun? It seems like I came to graduate school because I was really passionate about these ideas and this research. And this isn't what I thought it would be. And Maybe it's the case that I should kind of throw away these rules and things, and we'll still need to do them to some extent. I need to graduate. But maybe I should be taking more risks. Maybe this would improve if I took more risk. So I stood back up, because I could have just stayed lying on the track and just had someone like wheel me away. But I stood back up, and I decided that I wanted to move forward, and I wanted to take more risks and really try looking at some of these problems that um, just seem like they wouldn't fit in line with the thesis. So the first interesting question I wanted to ask can I learn about research practices from brain coordinate data? And this was a data set that I was working at at the time. Let me give you a little bit of background about how neuroimaging results report results. Uh, so the idea is that you have some statistical map. It has this uh, coordinate of sort of a maximum value. Uh, value. For example, this has an XYZ coordinate. And you can't really take this big, ugly data object and like embed it in a paper. And so what researchers do is they report the coordinates in tables. And so very sort of sophisticated methods for meta-analysis have been totally developed toward reproducing these brain maps and then saying like what the literature has to say about them. So I looked at this data, and everyone is using, this is sort of data that everyone's using the same way over many, many years. And I noticed something else. Specifically, I noticed that there's also information about the people, about the researchers, the authors. And I said, huh, maybe I can take this method and I can sort of twist it a little bit. And so what I decided to do is instead of representing, um, for example, a term in a paper. So the idea is that um, when you look at these coordinates, they would associate these coordinates with uh, values from the text. So a bunch of coordinates associated with the term anxiety would probably have a brain map that represents what the, what's going on in the brain during the experience of anxiety. So I said, whatever terms, I'm going to look at a certain set of coordinates that are associated with an author. So Ahmad Hariri, I worked with him at Duke. And so these are his coordinates. So OK. That was a start, but you know, obviously this just looks like a ball of like whatever, and it's not very interesting. So I knew that I needed a novel way to sort of visualization to visualize this because someone who doesn't know about brains, doesn't know about imaging, is gonna wanna try to answer the question, what does this researcher study in the context of behaviors? And so I came up with this visualization that I called the brain lattice. And so what the brain lattice is, I start out with 525 different brain maps. So each map represents sort of what's going on in the brain during the manifestation of some behavior, anxiety, working memory, et cetera, et cetera. I then uh, generated a self-organizing map with those maps. And so the idea is that if you have a grid of nodes, to each node um, is mapped um, some set of behavioral terms, and then distance in the map represents similarity. And then what I could basically do is take my author brain map, those author sets of points, and map them to the nodes. And that would calculate a similarity score. I could then color it by the similarity score. So let me just show you what this looks like so it makes more sense. You can't read these little labels here, but this is the, um, this is the map for Ahmad Hariri. And so the hotspot that's in the map, so what, what you can't read on here are the little uh, behavioral terms. So hotspots in the map down here are terms related to anxiety, depression, sort of. And that is exactly what Ahmad studies. He also does a little work in decision theory and science. So that's this other hotspot here. So this is really cool because I can now represent all of an uh, author's contributions to neuroscience based on this one picture. And so um, another thing I thought would make sense as well, if I'm sort of a student and I want to know what lab to go into, I'd want to find you know, the anxiety researcher. You can, you can explore this map by finding anxiety, clicking on it, and then it will retrieve from the database all the authors and show you what they study. You can click on an author to explore uh, more fully. And so the other interesting thing I could get from this data is the fact uh, co-authorship. So I realized I could figure out sort of like I could make an author collaboration network. And so I did exactly that. I made um, an author collaboration network where I could, for example, search for Ahmad Hariri. And so I type it up there, I search for the map, and then, nope, there's his node. And then I can say, oh, who does a mod work with? 
And that should be, that's James Gross, who's another anxiety researcher. And so then I would want to basically put these things together. I would want to say, OK, for Ahmad Hariri, what I can figure out now by putting these things together is who are his collaborators. It's sort of like a collaborator finder, because I can rank. What you see here is a ranked list of authors based on having similar brain maps to Ahmad. And then this dot here represents the similarity. And the points in red represent the authors that are the other authors that are actually collaborating with him. And what I found across many of these neuroscientists is that the people who were doing the most similar work to them, they weren't working with them. They weren't talking to them. They had never published a paper with them. And so I learned that, wow, I mean, I wasn't surprised, but you know, researchers don't talk to each other. OK. <laughs> and this was really cool. This was actually a, we a project that I did for fun on a weekend. And it was really cool because it turned into a paper. Um, and it was the first sort of kind of fulfilling paper because I felt like I had had a cool idea and built a tool and then uh, had something that I could offer to other people to use it. OK, so what did I learn? Um, so the, actually, there's a really interesting component of this work that isn't represented in the paper. After or right before I was about to publish it, um, I went to my advisor and I said, you know, we can learn so much more about these authors. You can go to a database of grants and funding, find the author, figure out what their funding was, and then look up their publications and basically figure out how well they utilize their resources. The other thing you can do is that you can basically extract different kinds of methods and statistical corrections they do from their paper and be the sort of statistical police and kind of point out people like, oh, this is bad practice. And it seems like it wouldn't be likely, but there's actually a lot of still really bad sort of even just simple, like, you know, not correcting for multiple comparisons kinds of things going on. Um, so I went, anyway, I took these things to my advisor and he said, Vanessa, if you do that, you are going to be hated by the community. So I didn't. But the point is that there is really more interesting stuff to look. In terms of what I learned, um, obviously, communication academia isn't great. Maybe we already knew that. Um, one really cool thing about this project, this was the first time that I had really taken everything. Because what you don't see sort of on the back end, there's a lot of um, computation that needs to happen sort of on a cluster. And then there's uh, scripts to make the visualizations. And then there's the entire web interface itself. I wanted to make it all just totally transparent, reproducible. So I wanted to share everything um, on GitHub. And then finally, this was the first time I really sort of got into D3. And I realized just in the same way it's empowering to be able to program and to like build anything that you can dream of. If you know how to make visualizations, custom visualizations, you can, you can really do anything. Was there any chance that the communication problem was a competition problem? Was it what? A competition problem. It was just, you know, there's another person who's oh, kind of like me. I'm not definitely. talking because I just want to get the glory myself. I think um, so researchers are just very hesitant to kind of even talk to each other because they're afraid that if they give someone else you know, their idea, then they get scooped and they lose the publication. Incentives, we can talk about this later. Incentives at academia are just totally screwed up, um, where they really should be just focused toward like solving the scientific problem, doing good science. But it's anything but that, um, unfortunately. And there's this other layer of challenge in basically taking this really complicated analysis thing and then being able to synthesize it into a visualization into something that is digestible and, and cohesive. That, so this is some of the things that I started to think about. So from this, I realized, oh god, we're in a really bad place. Nobody's talking to each other. How can I help the neuroimaging community? And so at the time, uh, neuroimaging community was sort of centered around Python. It still is. It's called NiPy. And this is NiPy.org, circa 2011, thanks to the Wayback Machine. And it seemed to me that this just very simple organization was a good place where I could sort of, um, I, if I could change even just like the website and the way they do things, I could get people more talking to each other. And so what I did, um, this is NiPy.org today. I made them a totally new site. Um, this is uh, hosted on GitHub Pages. It's a Jekyll site. It has details about the code of conduct. And then how do you actually contribute? Um, it also has a blog that looks like it's integrated to the site, but this is actually an embedded Tumblr blog. So anyone who doesn't know how to code can go in and write and blog about their research sort of things. Um, it's totally uh, tested, has continuous integration. Um, and then importantly, everything that happens on here gets immediately pushed to the NiPy Twitter, which you know everyone and their grandmother is using Twitter, so I didn't see why uh, NiPy wasn't using Twitter. Um, and so this is, so now it's interesting, these very small changes have just really improved sort of communication and sort of the feel of the community. When you search for NiPy, you find this um, that we that we have sort of a place. 
And so in, in that same thread, um, a couple of years ago, one of my friends named David Zhang, he was throwing around this idea about making a science podcast. And he and I said, you know what, this is a great idea. You sort of do the hard work, recruit the writers. I will put together sort of um, the branding and the vision and all the back, the back infrastructure so that it works on iTunes and we can push episodes. And I made our goggles guy. You can't see his mouth. He's actually like the top of a microphone wearing goggles. And so um, a couple of years ago, no, in November of 2013, we made Goggles Optional, which is a podcast run by Stanford scientists. And our motto is, we put on the goggles so you don't have to. And this is a really important thing because, um, at least for communication about results in the media, they're often like over-sensationalized or just totally misrepresented. So we take real science and we explain it um, in a level that's sort of understandable. We also make it fun. Um, and our podcast has been really successful. We have, I think, just over 60,000 downloads. We're on our 132nd episode. And this is a really um, empowering for me because I realized that having impact goes so much farther beyond what you think it would be, which is just having these publications. And so after, after these two little things, and I've, I'm obviously very into sort of making web-based tools, it's very apparent to me that everything that happens anywhere is sort of happening in a web browser. And unfortunately for neuroimaging, everything was still happening on people's desktops. And so this next idea, I said, you know what, can I make web-based tools to explore neuroimaging data? This seemed like a really important thing to work on. And so my first effort was a functional um, brain imaging connectome in your browser. I would basically do some processing of functional data. So you get this interactive um, viewer where you could explore the nodes. And, but the problem was this was that it took a bunch of pre-processing, and then you'd have your data. And, then you, and this didn't seem like the right thing to be working on at the time. I wanted to get this raw brain map, which is basically a 3D map of numbers, into a browser. And so I first decided that um, what needed to be done was make it just really easy to have a folder of brain images and just open them up in your browser. And so um, Node.js. Is, seem like the right solution because you can make very little easy applications with it. So my first thing was the brain browser. And it's really simple. You just type BB, and it opens up on your console. And then you, uh, you can explore different brain maps. You can search. Um, you can download them. But the problem with this is that a lot of data that neuroimaging scientists work with isn't always going to be on their computers, right? It might be on, for example, a web server. So I said, huh. Can I optimize, not just like make a tool for seeing stuff, but can I actually optimize a web server for showing brain images? And I had this idea because of this. Uh, this is sort of the Apache default view um, index, uh, file index. And it made, and I, had, and I knew that this existed because I'd so many times gone on the HT access file and just turned it off. And it made sense to me that this had to be some sort of default view that Apache knew how to render. And so maybe I could just change that default view and like plug a brain map into it. And so what I did is I dug in a little bit, and I found that uh, this, this module is called mod auto index. And you can, of course, do things with indexing here. But what you can also do is you can also specify a specific file to do the directory index. So I made my own, this one. And you can either specify it. So this line would mean it would, be, it would be the entire server, or you can just do it for a single folder. And so, so here's the little file. Actually, yeah, you can't even read that. So basically, what you, all you have to do in the PHP file is um, expect that a couple of variables are going to be sort of like your server address, where you are, and then basically um, read in the different files, parse out the extensions and stuff, and then later in the script, do whatever you want with them. And so I created the nifty index. This is running on my little server. And so basically, it's the same exact thing. You can go into subdirectories, click around, go on a brain map. Um, what I, it downloads right to your machine, because that seemed like the functionality that the user would want. You can also click decode, and it sends the map to this external database called Neurosynth, which will give you sort of behavioral terms that are associated with the map. So, um, <laughs> but unfortunately, neuroimaging researchers are even lazier than that. I wanted to be able to take a brain map and just drop it on my browser and just like have magic happen. Um, and so I wanted, I also wanted to be totally static, not have any sort of th things running on the back end. And so this was uh, when File Reader was sort of coming out. And so I developed the uh, nifty drop where you just saw what happens. You take the nifty file, you put it in the drop zone. The drop zone is listening for the file. It loads the imaging data here. And then it loads the header information here. And it just works. And to show that this is actually static, it's running on GitHub pages. Uh, and so if you look at um, one of the things my lab has developed is a database of brain maps called NeuroVault. I've had a huge impact. I've put all of my viewers into NeuroVaults to immediately empower researchers. For example, here's 
a um, version of what I just showed you, except now I've made it so that you can click on different buttons of activation and it will take you to that coordinate in the brain map. And so all of the solutions that I've showed you thus far are about taking a brain map and then rendering it as it is. But one thing I really like to do is, for example, custom visualizations with D3. I'd want to be able to make some kind of graphic rendition, rendition of a brain map. So that was this next idea. And so there was a software at the time called um, Nylearn. Nylearn had a function to produce this orthogonal view. So what you're looking at here is an orthogonal view um, of a, a brain atlas. So each region is sort of associated with a, a certain number, and that gets rendered as a color. And it had a function that would export an SVG. I said, great. So I made this SVG, but then there, I looked at the data, and I said, oh my goodness. So if you, I don't know if you can see this, but this is not SVG. This is taking a PNG data and shoving it inside of an SVG data structure and calling it an SVG. This needed to be paths so I can control them. I can't do anything with this. So I said, I wonder if I can make, if I can redo this and make my own uh, real SVG with paths. And so, um, and you can see the whole exploration of that link, but I, took, I started with sort of the base image and I tried different filters, different sort of um, ed things for edge detection. I then stumbled on this thing called Fizen Walbs or Malb something method. Um, I applied a little bit of extra sort of tweaking to it. And what I eventually came up with was a way to sort of take a particular region. So this region here is just the yellow part in this brain map and then break it into the pieces. And then for each piece, I could draw on an SVG an actual path. And so, and I did that with Caro, which you can communicate with. It's a system library, but for example, you can communicate from Python with like PyCaro. And so what does that look like? This is, what, this is what an SVG looks like when it actually has a path in it. This is what I had expected to see and I was very happy to have made. And so then I could immediately make custom visualizations with this map. So what you see up here is um, the SVG that I produced. And then the user can interact with it up there, selecting to turn on and off different brain regions. And then it will render in a scatter plot here. So the idea is that this is one brain image and this is another brain image. And you might want to discover some correlation between two regions that wasn't apparent when sort of all of the data is there. And so this is D3, but the issue about this view is that in order to get this to render in a, a browser, D3 handles a couple of thousand points OK. Once you go over that, it really is just not going to work. Um, but I really wanted to get all like 150,000 points in the browser, so I needed a different technique. And so how do I get the entire brain map into the browser? I found this thing called Canvas. Well, it's not a thing. It's out there, Canvas. And what I basically did is I had a strategy where I took 1,000 points in a queue at once, and I would just plot them onto the screen as static bitmap points. And with this strategy, I can, I can do the same thing. I can sort of filter based on regions. Here's the exact same SVG you see down here. Except now, this is like 100 and, over 150,000 points in the browser in like under four seconds. And so this, this seemed like it was good to me. And so why am I sort of stressing sort of visualization so much? Um, I think it's really important because I think, at least in research, and it may be true in other things too, people tend to not look at their data. And it's not easy enough to look at your data. And a matter of fact, bad things happen when you don't look at your data. So I want to share you a little story of something that happened recently that kind of motivates this. So what happens? So I was doing something. This is for my dissertation, so like, doesn't matter what I was doing. But basically, there's this bread and butter um, operation in neuroimaging where you take a t-statistic map and you convert it to a z-score map. And every software package has it, um, a method to do it. So here was my original data, like looks pretty good. I then plugged it into the software and oh my god, like what happened? So I don't know what happened, but there was like all this huge, like huge amount of just zeros were just randomly appeared. And then there was like this weird truncation thing happening. And I said, well, maybe it's just the software's bad. I plugged it into a different software and oh my god, like the same thing happened. And so I, I was really curious about this, so I started like searching around the internet, like T to Z, truncation, sparsity, like what is going on? And I found this paper by this guy named Paul Huguette, and it turns out that the standard procedure to uh, do this conversion relies on p-values. And so if you have a really big distribution, your p-values get really, really tiny, like point oh oh oh, you know, basically toward machine precision, those values go to zero. And so that's why we see all those extra zeros. So what this guy did, instead of using um, p, he basically substituted q equals 1 minus p as sort of this intermediate variable. 
and it solved this problem. So I said, oh, well, this seems important. So what I did is I implemented a version for brain maps uh, called TZ, and the distribution looks correct as it should be. Um, but this was a really scary discovery for me because nobody had noticed this. The thing is, if you look at a statistical map sort of in its standard view, you can't tell if a value is truncated. It'll, it'll look, the spatial map will look the same. And it just terrified me that people weren't looking at their data in different ways. And this is just such strong evidence that you need better tools to encourage researchers just to look at simple plots like this. So yes, we need better, we need better tools, et cetera, et cetera. So the next thing I wanted to do, I said, okay, brain maps, this, this is sort of, I've worked on this problem. What about an analysis workflow? Because obviously if you've seen like this reproducibility crisis in science, like we're not very good at being able to show an entire workflow. And so this is my PI, this is Russ Poldrack. At the time he was finishing up this big project called My Connectome Project. And broadly what he was doing over about two years was collecting lots of different imaging, behavioral metrics, and then uh, metabolomics and genomics. And this was going on uh, since October 2012 Feb to February 2014. And what you see here are all these different kind of things that he collected, and then the number of measurements over there. And so when I first kind of saw this data set, I was like, well, I can make something cool. And so I, I made sort of little interfaces to show, for example, like the, the connectivity data, um, the genomics data. This will show the brain connectivity. It'll let you explore based on the region. It shows the corresponding brain images over there. You can export it as an SVG, because I figured if you're a researcher, you want like to put in a paper or something. But this didn't really feel like it was like that useful towards solving this like reproducibility problem. And so an interesting thing about this particular project, because it was so big, Russ was talking to many different groups and he had many different like analysis pipelines that he needed to basically run a million times and probably just out of sort of logistics and a little bit of laziness, he basically made a, a module to run everything. And so he came to me and he's like, Vanessa, I have all these scripts together in a module, like can we turn this into a reproducible thing? Like what does that look like? And I said, well, let's start with a virtual machine because you know, we're going to be dealing with sort of software de dependencies and that kind of thing. And maybe um, and this, this, this seems like the best way to go. So I found Vagrant, didn't, had never used it before, but it seemed like the right thing to do. And so then I said, OK, my Connectome VM, what would that look like? What are sort of my goals for this? Well, I would want it to be deployable with one commander click. If you know Vagrant, that is Vagrant up, done. I then would also want the data to be downloaded from the cloud. You can keep a lot of things in a GitHub repo, but largely like a lot of these huge brain maps really need to be downloaded from somewhere. And this is actually a bigger, more challenging problem than it seems because the, I found that different resources had sort of different reliabilities um, and that even just the simple task of like downloading stuff, could, you, could re, you could have a lot of sort of um, bottlenecks. I also wanted the user to be updated about the progress. So the entire analysis took like 12 hours. And so if the user just like ran the virtual machine and then they, not, they saw nothing, like that's, that's just not okay. And then finally, um, well to go along with that, error and output log should be available. But then when everything was done, I wanted the results to be sort of explorable. And I wanted the viewer to be able to see everything and have the satisfaction of knowing that that was going on. And so to solve these goals, I built the My Connectome Viewer, the virtual machine. This is uh, deployed at results.myconnectome.org. And basically what happens is you do Vagrant up, everything installs, and this opens up in your browser. These are the four components of the analysis. These coincide with sections of the paper, so it sort of makes, it's intuitive for someone who's read the paper. And basically as these files, as files appear, as results are generated, the links will go from gray to green. Then when you click on a link, you'll be able to get sort of an interactive report. It could be R Markdown, IPython Notebook, PDF, or just some kind of HTML page, um, doesn't matter. Uh, the other thing that happens is that the users always kept updated about the progress as the analyses progress. And the way that I did that is by running it many times, getting estimates for how long each thing took, and then I can basically give them an estimated time remaining based on the, file out, the output files that have not been produced yet. And then when everything's done, this, uh, this button is exposed, which will let them explore the results. And so as I mentioned, here's an example of the log. There's a complete error log and output log. The data explorer will let you select different variables for here. And for most of these, what researchers really want to see when it comes down to it is sort of correlation, effect size, and then Q values. And these are sort of searchable and sortable, um, so you can find what you're looking for. And one detail that you can't see in the static view is that 
So one thing I really like to do is put little bits of sort of beauty in, in these design. And so this, um, this banner here, when you mouse over it, will sort of change a little matrix style. And the other thing this graphic shows is that the interface refreshes itself every 15 seconds so that it can be updated. And actually, the uh, banner itself is a tool. Um, I made it so that you can go to this little, whatever, my website, and then type in whatever you want, and then create your own interactive uh, banner. <laughs> Because it's very useful, right? <laughs> OK, so at, at the time, um, Russ was also coming out with this paper that talked about a lot of sort of this, uh, this work and, and cognitive neuroscience. And they came out with this really cool cover, which is sort of um, calling the matrix a little bit. But when I saw this, there was something like completely wrong about it. And the fact is, it's not moving. When you see the matrix and all the O's and ones, it's like and it's moving up and down. So I thought I could give this a better try. So I made my own interactive version. I think you can kind of see that. But the cool thing is that um, hidden in the letters coming down, I put actual cognitive atlas terms. When you mouse over the little brains, it will show you terms from the cognitive atlas. You can then click on them, and it will take you to the cognitive atlas to explore it. And this seemed like a better uh, representation of like, the idea they were trying to get out than the cover. Also at the time, um, the neuroimaging was, neuroimaging was having a data sharing special issue. And so one of my lab mates made this cool background, where, which is a brain map made of little brain maps. But I think he had to pay like an online service where he like uploaded images and it was sort of annoying and hard. And I said, huh, I wonder if we can use brains as pixels. And so um, I came up with ArtBrain, which uh, is a pretty simple method, but it works as follows. Basically, I generated a bunch of randomly sliced brains of random colors with open source data from NeuroVault. I then would generate a color lookup table for the mean color of each brain map. Then what I could do is read in an image, and for some sampling rate, I could basically match that pixel to some, uh, some, to some brain map in my lookup table. But I added a little bit of noise, because if you always selected the brain, same brain map every time, the image would be terribly boring. And so what did that produce? Well, rendered it, then it would open up in your browser. So then you could take any sort of image and then render it completely in tiny little brains. Specifically, we can zoom in. All of the pixels are these tiny little brains. And so here's some of my favorites, uh, Vermeer's Girl with a Pearl and then uh, Jigglypuff. And I thought this would be really cool, but it, it looked pretty cool in your browser, but I wanted to um, really see it at scale. And so I found that Stanford has this dive, or it's called the hive, because it's not complete. It's a 3D wall. It's called uh, the hive. And so I made portraits of everyone in my lab, and I took them there, and I surprised them with themselves in huge 3D brains. They were happy. I think they liked it. <laughs> I think they liked it. Wow. So then I said, huh, I wonder if I can flip this around. What about images on the brain, so the brain as the canvas? And so a couple years ago, I had done this little stupid MATLAB project where I had um, basically reverse ICA. So I would hide a message in data. And then if you did ICA, it would come out. In, so like, here's a K. I don't know how interesting that is. So, this, so I said, OK, I want to be able to like take, this is around Christmas time. That's why I use Santa. I want to be able to take Santa. And I basically converted him to integer values. And I probably don't need to go over this in detail. But basically, you read in the channels of your data. One's an alpha channel. It doesn't have to be there, though. You basically combine them into an integer value, and then you normalize. Um, and then you have to scale it to fit onto the brain map. And then you write it into, I decided to do an axial layer. Axial is like you cut someone's head with an ax, so it's like the biggest view you can get. And it looks like, and so it opens in their, brain in their browser, and it looks like this. So here's, we have Santa. You can also do it for sort of goggles guy. And so the last thing I, I did sort of playing around with this idea of like different fun things to do with brains is what about a 3D brain? And so at the time, um, my lab mate, Chris, he wrote this blog post. He said, this is my brain sharing the risk. And to me, this was more of like a challenge. Like, what can I do with this that would be interesting and surprising? And so first, I took his brain and I did some simple analyses to extract gray and white matter and to make a, a 3D model and you know, standard brain imaging software. But then I figured out how to um, export that model into like real 3D software. So Blender is what I have sort of on Ubuntu. So I made this 3D model. And then I found a 3D printing studio at Stanford. And so I printed Chris's brain, and I presented Chris with his tiny brain. And it was really, really, it was really awesome. Um, he eventually figured out it was his brain. And so at this point, I'm sort of having fun with all these sort of different visualizations and going into like the third quarter. Um, and 
as you can imagine, as a grad student, you have to read a lot of journal articles. And I was always plagued by this question, why are they so boring? And so my first effort to make it better is I made this thing called PubMed Lib, which would let you enter search term. It would then retrieve an article from PubMed, parse the different parts of speech, and then here it asks the user to enter just a random sampling of those words, um, whatever you please, and then you submit. And then it would basically render the abstract in what I thought would be much more interesting, essentially Mad Libs for you know, PubMed abstracts. So this is, this is useless, um, but it's kind of fun. A larger idea I had is, and this is sort of a general kind of observation, there tend to be a lot of really nice tools and sort of like things that you can use if you're like a web developer. For example, have you guys heard of Font Awesome? Yeah, so Font, Font Awesome is basically like web, web fonts. And so if you, if you see like a search bar icon, 80 to 90% sure that's probably a Font Awesome icon. It just makes it very easy to insert sort of these icons that you don't, they're so common you don't even see them anymore in web browsers. And I was like, why is it the case that like researchers don't have something like that? And on top of that, maybe we can take something that's kind of dry and like just a standard representation of something like a method section. And maybe I can come up with a different way to show the exact same thing. And so I came up with Font Brain, which you're not seeing all the icons, but it's a bunch of different icons. And then this is actually a rendering of this exact same method. And it's interactive too. Um, so for example, when you mouse over the things, it will say, okay, for registration, this is the method that we're using. This is the kind of brain map. And it's in this, this standard template space. If you click on any of these links, it goes right to the page. So you can actually read about the details of the method. And so what this idea is, um, and this is something I like to think about a lot, is how can we take these standard representations of information, of methods, like things that you see every single day, and uh, think about them differently, and maybe make a new view that um, is more fun, or just that people will be more incentivized to actually use. And so along these same lines, um, a similar question is, how can you extract new knowledge from sort of these standard resources that you sort of uh, use every day? And so I'll give you, I've done a million projects like this, but this is just one example I'll, get, I'll show. Um, my, one of my friends, Maud, who does something totally different, she's a microbiologist. She was looking at these different data structures to describe genes. And I noticed that, I don't think you can read this, but I noticed that there was a country field. So this says countries, some, some country in Spain, read Le Vigo. And I said, huh, I wonder if we can map the gut microbiome, or at least the human gut microbiome. And this was many years ago, actually, before sort of the microbiome became like a thing. Um, and so what I did is I found this database of these data structures. I parsed them all for this exact field. I then found that Google has an API where you can basically get a latitude and longitude for a location. And so for about um, 100 out of 250,000 queries, and I, I only did that many because my PI very commonly gets mad at me when I'm using our computational resources for things that are not, I don't know, not what I should be using them for. So I, I only did 100K queries. I filtered it down to Homo sapiens, and then I mapped it out, and it was really disappointing. <laughs> um, so I said, OK, basically at the time, all of the data that was sort of coming, at least out of PubMed, for at least half the queries was from Spain um, and then basically Chicago. So this in the particular analysis wasn't super interesting, but it's this exact kind of thing, basically taking something that is intended for something else and then figuring out a new way to use it to potentially uncover new knowledge that's really important. Because what if we had had enough data here? We could have gone to the papers and then found some sort of interesting correlation with like geographic location and maybe something that they found in the paper. And so a, sort of a problem that's more close to kind of the kind of things my lab does. So I'll tell, well, let me tell you a quick story. So my lab, uh, we have this ontology called the Cognitive Atlas, and we spent like eight months just defining like, I don't know, different relationships and entities and it was painful and it was awful and I was like oh my god we need like we need a data driven way to do this because I never want to do it again um, so maybe we can learn those sorts of things from publications and so I came up with a solution um, it's called wordfish it's this little tool for standardizing corpus and terminology extraction because I, I realized that a lot of people a lot of researchers generally will want to like have some corpusy thing have some other texty thing they want to find in the corpusy thing and then they'll basically want to like put those things together and then maybe do some kind of machine learning to find relationships or something. And I was running into the problem where, have you guys heard of deep dive at Stanford? I was running into the problem with deep dive that it's like an over, sort of an over end, well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say negative things, but it seemed like it was too complicated for really what I wanted to do. Um, I, this was a much simpler problem, and so I, I decided to make Wordfish. And so 
The way that WordFish generally works is that, so it's, it's a Python thing, it's based on this idea of plugins. And so a plugin is basically a script that has a data structure that will um, either identify it as like a terminology or a corpus. And so anyone can like write a plugin for their particular terminology, their particular corpus, then it makes it immediately available to anyone that uses the application. And so you install it with Python, um, you basically, so for this first thing, I'll obtain a large corpus. So one of the plugins, for example, is Reddit. So about 250,000 different Reddit posts. I then um, would actually parse the text. And so parsing a corpus, just basically the standard stuff, removing stop words, non-English characters, et cetera, et cetera. And then I'd want to uh, generate. And so the goal here is to find an unsupervised way to find relationships between terms. And so I found this method called word to vec that is engineered by Google. Um, I can share a paper after if you're interested in it, but it will basically generate word embeddings or vector representations of words based on the context. And this is really cool because then, well, let me show you. Um, well, first, let me show you what sort of the application use case looks like, because this is probably what you would be, a user would be uh, dealing with. So it asks for some basic sort of configuration stuff. And then it says, oh, look, we have and so then it interactively queries the GitHub repo to find all the plugins that are available. It says, oh, we have these terminologies, we have these corpus, just select the ones you want to use. You select them, it downloads this application to your folder or to your computer. Then what you basically do is you just extract this in your cluster environment. Um, you then just basically have to define like a work folder and then you install it. Installation um, just basically means then you can go to uh, the scripts folder. In the scripts will be automatically generated all of the jobs that you need to do the extractions, to find the terms, et cetera, et cetera. And what it does is it produces a standard data, um, a standard folder hierarchy that has sort of your sentences and then your terms. And so um, this is an example of an analysis pipeline. So basically, I don't think you can actually read that. Yeah, that looks pretty terrible. So basically you define directories and then you read in your corpus, uh, you make the models, um, you, you build re defined relationships, and then you just save them in different formats. Um, but uh, so when I talk about the mod, I've been talking about models and stuff, and you probably want to know more details about this. So word to vec, um, generally you can think of it as it's either going to be a continuous bag of words model or a skip gram. And the basic idea is that you're either going to be from a word context. Let's say I have a word here. These are the words to the left and the words to the right. I want to be able, be able to predict the word. Or with skip gram, I'm going to start with a word and then I'm going to want to predict the context. And so what I could do is, for example, all these terms in the Cognitive Atlas ontology, I would want to do this model because I could take a context, so some, some text corpus or whatever, and then predict um, the, the related uh, terms. And so just to show you an example, after building a model, you can say, OK, what is the most similar to anxiety? And then it will return to you back the most similar um, other word vectors uh, just based on the similarity score. And so. Um, what I did, so I, I derived a model using a bunch of neuroimaging corpus, and then for all of the terms in this ontology that my lab worked on, I calculated pairwise similarity. You can't see any of these labels here, um, but there's really interesting structure here. But then I ran into a really big problem, and the fact is that there's no way to validate this because we don't even have actual like term, I mean, this is a totally human-generated thing. This is unfortunately where it sort of stopped, um, and I'd, I'd love to talk about it if you have ideas for how to validate something that's doesn't really have anything like that. Uh, but there's actually another sort of interesting uh, use case for this kind of thing, and that is this idea of can I classify disorders based on Reddit posts? And so this is a really interesting, how, how, who, who's like an avid user of Reddit here? Anybody? A little bit, yeah. The interesting thing about um, Reddit is that I found that if you go to, for example, the depression board, you find posts like this. People that really have depression and, for example, and that are writing about like their daily life. And I realized that the signal for like a phenotype of depression is like sitting in front of all of us. It's like right there on Reddit. Yet here we are, for example, at Stanford and researchers are like trying to like collect all these different data things, um, getting health information. But really, if you want to sort of uncover this phenotype, you don't really need to look farther than Reddit. And so the, the goal of this model would be to be able to have some post like this and then be able to predict that, yes, this is a depre uh, depression post. And so what I basically did, I derived a word embeddings model for Reddit. Um, this meant doing it for the entire corpus, and that gave me a vocabulary size just under 9,000. 
And then for each post, I can then basically map that post to that vector space by taking a mean of the words that are in the model. And then you don't need to use SVM. I just happened to choose it, because why not? Um, but I, I built SVMs to predict disorders based on the text. So for example, and I dealt with multiple labels just by building pairwise models. And so for example, for anxiety or atheist, I'd subset the data to all the posts for those two things. I'd hold out 20% for testing, 80% for training, build an SVM, save accuracy metrics. And I have a big table of these um, on GitHub to explore if you're interested. But what I'll show you is the absolute worst performing one here, um, just, which is about 68% accuracy, distinguishing between the boards cringe and nice guys. I'm not even totally sure what that means. Um, and you know the, the testing set is kind of small, and, and it's not great. But the thing about this, the, the interesting result is that for most of the results, they did very well. Um, and so for example, for Alzheimer's and bipolar, which have you know, at least more reasonably sized boards, there's only six false positives, 60 false negatives. And this makes a lot of sense to me, because when you look at these boards, the way that um, the language and the context is very different. And so the next stage of this work would be, OK, what particular sort of words or what, what context of that is really is being used in the model to distinguish between these two things. And you probably wouldn't want to use SVM if you want something interpretable, but um, I, haven't, I haven't explored anything beyond that. So yes, you can learn about disorder from Reddit. I actually took this idea to my PI, and he just totally said no, because you can't, he couldn't imagine publishing a paper and talking about using Reddit. OK. <laughs> um, and so the full results are there if you want to take, uh, explore them. So this next question um, came up actually because of another interesting story. The idea is, can I, measure, can I standardize the measurement of behavior? So modern behavioral collection in psychology looks like this. You have people come into a lab. You sit them down in a computer. Or maybe you don't even send this to sort of like Amazon Mechanical Turk. And they push buttons, and they respond. So this is the Stroop paradigm, which I'm sure you guys are familiar with. And that's it. But the problem is that everyone implements their own thing, and it's always, there's always bugs. Um, you can't reproduce things from a paper. And so there was a, there's a, this is my fellow grad student in my lab. So he had this interesting question, can I sort of, what are all the different ways we can measure cognitive control? He said, mm, how do I answer this? Oh, I have an idea. I'm going to make a lot of these experiments. And matter of fact, I'm going to send them to Amazon Mechanical Turk, because there's like lots of big data there. And then. He found this thing called SciTurk, which would basically use a little Flask application that would help him code his experiments and send them to Mechanical Turk. And so his strategy was to basically start hard coding them into this one massive folder. And so I was peeping over his shoulder, and I was like, huh, I wonder if there is a better way we can do this. And specifically, I wonder if there's a way that we can sort of take advantage of all the hard work that he's doing so that other people can use it as well. And so I said, can we think of these experiments not as this hard-coded folder, but instead these modular things that we can sort of select and move and change as we want? And then, so we'd probably need some software for, for sort of controlling them. And then you could also plug them into like whatever deployment you want. And so this was rationale that we, I came up with the Experiment Factory, which is an open source framework for development and deployment of web-based experiments. Um, this is totally, this is pretty recent work. Um, and generally, I, these, these are the three goals that I thought were really important. The first is just to provide tools for end users. The second is that I wanted a modular infrastructure. I wanted it to be possible to define this, this sort of component experiment and plug it into some other component that is like um, an environment. And then modern technology and design are just really important because if something isn't beautiful, no one's going to want to use it. And so this is what, uh, what it looks like. This is deployed at expfactory.org. So the idea is that a researcher can log in. When they log in, they can interactively just add experiments to their battery. Uh, they can manage what's called a hit on Amazon Mechanical Turk, um, different studies. They can also have subject management. Uh, we have a blacklist, and I also just recently added a credit condition. And then there's the different deployment options. So you can either serve it locally, like sending someone a link or having them sit in the lab to a link, or you can just send it directly to mturk. This is totally Dockerized. So right now, expfactory.org is still close. It's, there's about five labs at Stanford and a couple collaborators using it, but we haven't opened it up to everyone because my PI is worried about sort of the intellectual things associated with that. But you can just take the Docker image and just deploy your own expfactory.org in like one command anyway. Uh, so the other thing, just to give you a sense of what these experiments look like, this is the standard experiment. The person reads instructions. 
and then they, you know, do some tasks. This is my favorite. I always like this game where you have to like get the one to look like that one. Um, our surveys, I wanted them to be just really modern and beautiful. So I used uh, Google's Material Design Lite. And we've recently added a Likert. And then uh, just to give you a sense of like what does it take to actually contribute a survey, I wanted this to be just super simple and easy. And so each survey is just a folder in a GitHub repo. When you look in the folder, there's a small configuration file that'll have like a couple basically variables that the software needs to know how to sort of deploy it. And then the survey itself is just a tab separated file with like with the type of question and then the question text and whether it's required and that sort of thing. So anyone, even if you don't know how to program, you can contribute a survey. Um, you probably need to know how to use GitHub, but you know, I can, I'm probably gonna make a tool that will you don't even need GitHub for. It. And so the other thing that I recently added, which is I'm really excited about, is games. Um, so it occurs to me that a lot of sort of traditional experimental experimental paradigms in psychology are kind of boring. And for example, if you're doing research with kids, they're not going to want to be doing like the Stroop task. And so this is an example of um, one of our math games where the kids has to like um, basically solve, add up the numbers to be able to cross the bridge. And these are cool because right now we have about eight different games and they're doing a pilot study where they take these games on tablets to schools and have the kids um, do them. Another cool thing about games is that they're totally sprite oriented. So you get much more than sort of like if the kid gets the right answer, you know, always you, you get the reaction times and sort of where they're touching the screen and a lot of really cool stuff. And so, so they're not just adding up there, right? So they've got some kind of visual constraints that will help them solve the problem. So it's not yeah. the equivalent task. Right. So yeah, so they're they're you more or less see when you're in the right range. Yeah. Which you wouldn't necessarily have in your mind if you're just thinking about the numbers. Right. So they're all there's there's about eight different, for example, just math games and they're all sort of different different. You're right that it's not just testing them to like think in their head to produce an answer. Um, so I, I, I know that three and, and you know six add up to nine. Mm -hmm. um, with that knowledge, plus making them look about the right length, I can solve that problem, whereas it's very diff different to the, the algorithm you would otherwise have to, to run. Yeah, I don't think I don't think this particular lab. I don't think their goal is to um, try to sort of derive like what's going on in, in the kid's head. I think I think they ran into the problem where they really needed a lot of data about kids answering math problems to associate with uh, brain imaging data, but they couldn't get the kids to actually do the games or to even hold their attention for long enough. Because you read it is gamification of paradigms is something that is sort of been talked about a lot. And the problem always comes down to the more gamified it becomes, the farther you move away from what you're actually trying to represent. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely, I just totally agree with what you're saying. So that's, that's sort of the balance and the drawback. Um, so expfactory.org, I also wanted it to be totally programmatically accessible to researchers. So we have a complete API, uh, which requires authentication, total documentation. Um, so this is a cool part. So uh, I always think it's very important to have testing of all your code whenever you have any kind of change. So all of our repos are on Circle CI. But I ran into a really big problem with this, and that is specifically that JavaScript bugs are terrible. And there wasn't a really good way to test JavaScript at runtime. And so my solution was to come up with the Experiment Factory robot. And the robot can run on your computer or in a continuous integration environment. And whether it's a survey or an experiment, the robot goes, and this is him slowed down so you could actually see something. But the robot goes through and answers all the questions. And if there's some kind of error, um, so we test all the experiments anytime there's any change. And if there's an error, then it will trigger a bug. And obviously, the PR won't go through. And so the other, so this is a, this is currently work in progress. Um, something that I'm kind of become a little bit obsessed with is like, can I learn about research practices and methods from actually not like the text? Everyone in, in academia is parsing like PubMed. I want to parse the code. Uh, and so my original, and so for example, maybe if I can take text, um, I could uh, try to figure out what methods are being discussed either from the text or from the equations. Um, I could maybe develop co uh, features of different code repos and then being, finding associations between the repos in the text and papers. I could then um, basically link, link the different repos to the methods based on these citations. And the general idea would be then a researcher could take a new paper, you could parse it, figure out the methods that are in it, and then give them advice about which kind of software they might be interested in. And then this other sort of higher level question like, can you identify components of good software? The piece of software has been cited a million times that might say that it's at least been used, so it's useful. And so what about that software makes it better than some other software that hasn't been cited? 
And so I came up with sort of repo fish. And my first step was to develop some kind of rec vector representation of methods. So I used the same word fish that I talked about before. I found this, <laughs> Wikipedia has everything. I found a list of statistical methods on Wikipedia. I then developed my um, vector representations. And I extracted images, links, and text because the cool thing about Wikipedia is that all of their images for uh, the latex, equ LaTeX equations, um, there are, you have the code embedded it essentially with the image. So you can basically parse those um, and come up with like a graph representation, for example. So I used the word devec and I built a model using all the text. I then map, I then would map each method onto the space and calculate similarity. And so what you're looking at here is all of those methods in similarity. And ironically, this kind of looks like a fish. And the cool thing is that, so for example, over here I saw lots of different types of distributions. Here you have sort of uh, metrics of central tendency and uh, standard deviation. These are sort of like high level kind of like data science-y ideas. Um, and then at the top, I think, was different kinds of models. And so what I basically wanted would want to do is to be able to take some text from somewhere and be able to understand how it maps onto the space uh, based on the text. And so my step two, I said, OK, I'm going to take PubMed central articles, because you have full text. I'm going to map them into this method space. Uh, so again, parse the text uh, for each paragraph in the text, basically create that vector representation, and then, um, and then map it. And so this is what I was going to do before my dissertation. Then my dissertation happened, and I didn't really work on it. So I realized this past weekend, I was like, well, maybe I could do something really quickly just to kind of get a sense of this. So I said, maybe I can look at Microsoft research publications. And so this was like Saturday afternoon. Um, so what I did is I scraped all of the abstracts from Microsoft research site. There's about just under 10,000 authors and just under 8,000 publications. There is the issue with uh, disambiguation of names. For example, if some people have like a middle initial. And I did the best that I could, but you know, it was just like an afternoon project, so I, I, I did my best. <laughs> um, I then wanted to generate an equivalent collaboration network based on who's publishing together. And then again, for each publication, turn it into a vector representation. And then I'd want to make a Dockerized visualization so other people can sort of play around and explore with it. And so here what you're looking at are the collaborations. And the good news is that this looks like a stinky hairball, which means that people from different groups are talking to another and collaborating. We're not seeing these isolated clusters. So I thought that was very good. Um, I sort of looked at the people in this group. And this looks, for example, here's like Bong Shin Lee. This looks sort of like a visualization group. Um, here's an example of the disambiguation problem because Jonathan, this particular Jonathan appears twice, once with the middle initial, once without. Um, over here, I identified researchers that are sort of um, machine learning and sort of data science oriented. Um, and so then I really only had time to answer like really basic questions, so like who has the most collaborations? And so here's a rank list. And I was hoping there'd be a big room of people so I could possibly embarrass somebody, um, but no, no big deal. And so for example, I looked at David Heckerman. So I built this Docker application so that I could just kind of start to look at my data. And I, I would say this is cheating for collaborate. That's too many people on that paper. Um, and so what are the dominant methods? Um, so what I did is basically take an average, um, an average across all of, um, for an average across all the scores for every single method. And this wasn't very surprising because you know, what you see is that sort of forecasting and inference and analytics methods are sort of on top. The one weird one here, oh, there it is, like spaghetti the, plot. The yeah, spaghetti, spaghetti plot. plot. So I looked at these pages, and I think the reason that they show up is because they have a lot of examples of like applications. Because the spaghetti plot is really comes down to sort of like um, some kind of scatter plot. And so because there's a lot of text that talks about applications, that's very going to be very similar to what you would find in abstracts. Um, and so my next, really the, what, what I was able to build in terms of visualization is answering the question, like, what methods does a particular author publish? And so, for example, here, um, you can search for an author, Michael Luby, who only has one publication. Um, so this is all of the you know, 2,800 different uh, methods. And I was pretty happy that in the top five, you start to see something about uh, Markov models. And so, what, what, and so what about the other question? What publications will match the method if I have a particular method in mind? And so for example, if I look up hidden Markov model, it will then return all of the uh, publications that I found with their, with their similarity score. And that is all the time that I had to do on Saturday afternoon because I don't know, I had to pack and stuff. 
Um, and so there's a lot of stuff I'm, that's under development here that I'm really excited to get into. I want to be able, I've already written functions that will basically describe, well, I started writing functions that would parse a Python script and then get sort of the functions and the arguments. And I realized that I don't need to do that. I can just look at the import statements and get most of what I need. Um, so I do that and I derive features. I'm also developing features based on the uh, file extensions um, in the repos and also the text content in sort of README. And I'm also, this is really cool, I want to develop a graph representation of a LaTeX equation. So then, because um, one of the things I notice is that when people talk about their method, for example, in the abstract, they're going to be missing a lot of sort of the, the details about the math and the distributions. But if I can parse the equations directly, then that will give me that sort of level of information. And so all of this is available at uh, Microfish if you're interested in exploring. And there's a Docker image too. And so in order to understand the space of Python functions, the other thing I quickly did was uh, scrape all of PyPy. And so this is uh, showing you all of these methods um, based on their dependencies. Here's sort of like Django and you know Pyramid. And then there's uh, functions up here for working with um, like HTTP, et cetera, et cetera. It's really, it's, it's unfortunate. You can't really see much here, but I can send you interactive versions of these if you're interested. Okay, so um, I think we're probably running out of, out of time, so I want to start to kind of summarize what, what, what are sort of the big ideas that I've sort of talked about in terms of what I've learned today. Um, the general idea is that solving, I found that it was really fulfilling to solve problems that will actually build tools to help people. And there are different levels of helping people. Pro the stuff that I have done is very niche. It's very specific, for example, the neuroimaging community. It's not going to like solve world hunger or anything. But I realize this is a lot more fulfilling than, for example, trying to like optimize an equation or you know, 0 0.0 by 0.01%. Uh, the other thing is that interesting problems are hiding in just everyday things. All of those little sort of pressure points in our daily life are sort of interesting problems that are worth looking at. The other thing is that complacency, sort of going into something with a very specific set of expectations, saying this is what I'm supposed to do, and just doing it is probably, and then just being sort of content with that is just so incredibly dangerous. And not only dangerous, it's, I just feel like it's boring. I mean, I think there's probably personality types this would be better for, but I find that it's much more fulfilling when you're just constantly sort of changing and being challenged. And with that goes, uh, like I said, expectations. And so um, sort of as I alluded to was sort of goggles optional and you know, really a lot of sort of this data exploration, having impact as a researcher, as sort of a person in general, goes far beyond you know, just publications or doing what you're supposed to be doing. And then finally, um, and this is something I think about a lot, how can we rethink sort of standard representations of, of, of information and also methods as well? And so I want to kind of come full circle and come back to the story in this race. What I didn't tell you about this race is that I didn't totally finish it. I, I collapsed about 10 meters before the end, and I was able to kind of stand up and like crawl over the line, and then I was just totally passed out in a tent, and I woke up there and like my, a couple hours later. But this is a really salient um, detail because I really stuck with it because I loved it. And a couple of years later, um, well, I got really, I got much better. I stuck with it because I loved it and I became a very successful competitive runner and we went on to win uh, races. But the reason this story is sort of meaningful for me is because of something my parents told me many years later. And it was that um, something my coach had said to them at the time is that Vanessa's mind wants to do more than she's, her body is capable of. And I feel that's really definitive of how I am. I feel like I come to all these different sort of points in my life and my level of thinking is always just beyond whatever environment I'm sort of currently in or what I'm currently doing. And so that's really why I'm here today um, in front of you. I, we can make sort of a, a metaphor about the kinds of problems that I've worked on up to this point. These, these very small problems, they're very niche and they're very specific, sort of like running routes. And, you may get some variability in the terrain, like maybe sometimes it's kind of like lumpy and bumpy, but generally like if you look at like the world of problems, what I've worked on is like this tiny little point. And I realized that there are so many, well, they're small and they're not so meaningful. Maybe they're meaningful for, for example, for neuroscientists, but they're not meaningful in a really big sense. And I have like these other problems that I'm starting, these questions that are starting to trickle into my mind that I'm really curious about, for example, can I identify dangerous jobs and maybe make them go away? Um, can, it seems like a, I'm a very allergic person. It seems like we don't really have this thing, like nutrition and allergy things sort of figured out. Can I advise people where to live based on like these very small details? Something I think about a lot is the fact that there are so many people out there that might have 
sort of anxiety or depression, and they're just kind of suffering. And maybe there's a better way that we can like identify these people and then help them build some kind of interactive environment. And then a really important thing is like how integrated sort of everything is becoming with like obviously the internet. And so how can we better integrate sort of um, human things like emotions into this space? Can my house know that it's me when I walk in and it's not someone else based on sort of collecting data? Um, there's this huge, and then there's sort of these non-traditional sources, like there's this huge source of, source of massive online, online, massive multiplayer online role-playing games where they would be huge sources of data for sort of decision-making and social things, but no one's really taking advantage of that and mining them. And so the reason that I'm here today is because I am hungry to, to answer these questions and I'm not convinced that academia is really the best place to answer them. And I want to find, I, the, what I see in Microsoft research is an environment that is just very rich, that offers opportunities to really learn and grow and take risks. And I'm re I really want to pursue that opportunity. And so that's all I have presented for you today. Um, I can definitely take questions. Um, thanks to my lab for just being awesome. And you guys actually funded me many years ago uh, with a little fellowship. So thank you to you as well. Um. <laughs> Great. <clears throat> Anybody have any questions? Um, well, I think we're all going to talk to you uh, yeah. today, so there's plenty of time for it. Uh, it's actually given me a great list of things that I'll show you at the end of the day, uh, since I haven't had a chance to do a, a much of our work so far. Um, but I imagine that Norman Darrell will have questions when I'm in here with you today as well. Okay. Do you, do you have any other questions for that, I guess? Uh, yeah, I have a very specific question, actually. Um, okay. You mentioned that. Um, that a lot of brain scans are in SVGs, and I was wondering, are those like the file format that, that oh, like, so they're brain, really available? In? So brain imaging scans aren't in SVGs. Brain imaging has a standard format called a nifty. One thing that neuroimaging neuro has done well is we have a really good standard file format. Um, the challenge is being able to take that data and put it in a format so that you can put it into different tools that would be more sort of consumable, both by researchers and by people who aren't researchers. And so in order to get like a brain map into a web browser, um, sort of you could take the approach, the first approaches that I was showing, like literally rendering the entire brain map. But what sort of makes sense to me is you'd want to have some kind of data structure that can both contain the data and then you could work with also in the web browser. And so that's why I was going for something like SVG, because I wanted to sort of kill two birds with one stone. Okay. Was that the Nashua Telegraph that was up there? Yeah. Okay. New Hampshire. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, well, thank you again okay. uh, for inviting me today. Sounds good. <laughs>